As COVID-19 spread, Black-owned small businesses paid a particularly hefty price. 40% of them are estimated to have closed forever. That got us thinking, how could the Facebook community support Black businesses in their time of need? It would take something big, something bigger than any event on the calendar. So we changed the calendar. Our answer was by Black Friday a movement that claimed Black Friday for Black businesses and turned every Friday into an opportunity to buy Black. Premiering a month ahead of the traditional shopping season, we launched the Buy Black Friday show. Welcome to the Buy Black Friday show, y'all. A shoppable entertainment experience hosted by comedian Phoebe Robinson that featured businesses, Black creators, public figures, product demos, and special guests. This week's theme is good for the world game changers. People didn't just watch, they shop. And we put Buy Black Friday everywhere we could. We turned Facebook's cover photo into a shoppable experience, created a gift guide, and challenged everyone to share the black owned businesses they love through Facebook. It is going to take creativity to move past the current climate. All black everything. Black artists, industry leaders, and influencers joined us, along with 37 brand partners. News media picked it up, and even Beyonce's mom showed some love. The live show received 86 million views. We drove over 200,000 click-throughs to businesses' pages, and 900,000 stories were made with the hashtag Buy Black sticker. But best of all, the businesses we featured saw exponential sales growth, with Redo reporting a 1,300% rise in sales. After all was said and done, we turned the biggest shopping season of the year into the best time to buy black. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Congressman Andre Carson from the great state of Indiana. I'm very pleased to once again host uh, our panel discussion for this year's CBC annual legislative conference. I also want to thank uh, Facebook for sponsoring this panel. You know, this year's panel will focus on the power of the youth uh, to lead our country to some would say a more perfect union, you know, from the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s to the current Black Lives Matter movements uh, and many more young people have led the way and served as our country's moral compass. We're very honored to convene a panel of experienced and passionate activists uh, to discuss and, 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 and leaders in the healthcare sector to discuss the legacy and work that lies ahead, our esteemed guests, are Yasmeen Anderson, CEO of Black Women in Charge, a wonderful Indianapolis-based uh, group of thought leaders and, and, and some would say activists. Uh, I think Hayat's on the call too, who's the director of uh, legislation for Black Women in Charge. Uh, my good friend, uh, the legendary, you've seen her on MSNBC, CNN, all over globally, nationwide. She's, she's, she's a firepower, Dr. Chris Purnell, She's a public health physician and fellow at the American College of Preventative Medicine. Um, Professor Sarah Baran, our policy scholar and advocate, she's here. She's done scores of panels uh, for Indiana University and so many other institutions. Uh, Anthony Murdoch, a very wise brother. He's an attorney. He's the founder of Murdoch LLC. It's good to hear what he has to say. Kelly Jones, the founder and general partner of 68 Capital, she's a rock star. My brother, Kenneth Allen, he's our commissioner at large for Indianapolis Public Schools. He's also uh, an entrepreneur and um, a pastor. And our moderator is my friend, uh, writer, scholar. She's currently in Boston, she's at Harvard right now. She's doing a lot. She is the co-founder of an app called Politicking, which is designed to help get millennials engaged in politics. We're looking forward to this discussion and now we'll hand it over to the great Jordan Wilson. 
Thank you so much, Congressman Carson. Hi, everyone. As a representative mentioned, my name is Jordan. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the moderator for today's conversation around pursuing innovation, justice, and change in such a critical time for Black people titled Undefeated Emerging Leaders. Young people have been at the forefront of movements throughout America's history. This forum is a platform for panelists to share your stories and lessons you learned around the country. Today, we'll have an opportunity to examine how you have influenced younger generations. And by getting started, I'll ask that you stick to the forum that I call on each of you. We've got people from education, tech, entrepreneurship, and political strategy. We're all going to go into detail about your respective efforts and work. And I'll ask also that you keep your thoughts to two to three minutes just so we can hear from everyone and all of your wonderful insight. So starting with Yasmin, I'd like to ask, this past year, most of us have experienced the most landmark moments in the fight for social justice in our lives. Simply put, black and brown people are under attack in this country and we've been historically. How have calls for justice impacted the direction of your work and your commitment? Thank you, Jordan, so much for giving me that question first. I think that it is the very essence of Black Women in Charge Incorporated. And from my perspective as Director of Operations, but also CEO as we've grown as an organization, it's been so important for us to not lose sight as liaisons between the community and the people, quote unquote, in charge, which I think is so important to recognize is a forum that not many people use on a daily basis in the way that it should, because the people who are oftentimes in the positions or in power to make the decisions do sometimes forget the people that put them there. And so for Black women in charge within the last year, I mean, we only, my first protest in life was in May of last year. Um, we only had three. And from there, we moved very quickly into the legislative process within our city and now federally. And I think that it's been a great opportunity to just understand that your call to action sometimes can shift. Yes, over the course of your work, but it can also come about in ways that you never expected it to. For us, that happened during COVID. And we we're just home from college with time as a lot of other people were. So things that a lot of times we at first recognize as inconveniences or just general negative thought patterns within our lives can also be turned directly into the biggest blessings that's ever happened for all of our 11 members. Thanks so much, Dr. Pernell. I'd love for you to take this question next. Sure. Um, where do I begin? So as a public health and preventive medicine physician, um, advocacy um, and sometimes even agitating for change has been bedrock to my practice. Um, and I've come of age um, in, in a nation that has not come to, a, let's say, full realization of its ideals. Um, and so much of my practice is not just purely medical or purely population health or purely public health or um, purely around the well being of communities, families, households, but much of my practice is how do we address the levers in systems and, and enact change? Um, and being um, proximate and being intimate where the energy is, where the vibrancy is in community is necessary to do that. Um, so you see that happen um, for me as a public health physician and a public health leader more broadly in various fashions, depending on the issue, right? So um, whether it's something around voter registration and public health physicians understanding that our patients, and those are young patients as well, those are millennials, those are patients across the spectrum, need to be able to understand their access to civic and civil rights. Um, and so how do we use our agency to tap into that? That means you need to be in covenant with community. Right. You need to be in in conversation, in dialogue with community, sharing power with community. Um, so I, I will begin there. It has to be an honest and transparent, bi-directional um, uh, conversation and an opportunity to share power bi-directionally in order to pinpoint the pain points, which are also the opportunities to bring systemic change. Share power, Dr. Purnell, that's extremely powerful. Professor Baran, I'd love for you to add uh, any of your insights to that question. 
Thank you. My name is Samantha uh, Baran. I use uh, she, her pronouns. Um, I work for a think tank that does criminal justice reform research, but here locally in Indianapolis, um, I do a lot of volunteer work with our local um, Black Lives Matter chapter around policy issues. Um, so most recently this past session, we um, did a lot of work around the right to counsel bill that was introduced by Senator Ford here in Indiana. And that would have um, given an attorney to people who are facing, you know, among other things, evictions in small claims court. And it's, you know, very relevant now as you know, with there's a lot of discussion around, you know, the eviction moratorium, and the, the eviction crisis, you know, that was at an emergency level before the pandemic hit. And so, you know, it was a way to, um, attack that and uh, potentially keep more people in their homes because a lot of the time, um, you know, people just don't know their rights and, you know, having an attorney is a way to, you know, help assert those rights in the affirmative. So that's, you know, the, the bill didn't uh, get a hearing, um, but so we do a lot of, you know, state level and then working around local issues that, you know, disproportionately impact the black community. Love that, extremely important work. Attorney Murdoch, please. Well, first, what I'd like to say is, you know, thank y'all so much for the opportunity to be able to come and speak. And I also want to say I'm a law school student. I appreciate y'all speaking positivity into existence. Your boy is almost there. Uh, but I'm very much still such I'm very much so still immersed in the law school experience. But that does not exclude me from being able to comment on such a conversation like this. I loved, loved, loved what Dr. Purnell said. She talked about proximal and intimate to community is necessary to sharing power bi-directionally. First of all, wonderfully articulated. I mean, from an elocution perspective, that was beautiful. But then two, I think while it's powerful and how it sounds, in practice, it's important too, right? Something that I realized as a law school student, as a Black man in a, in a law school, so many times I'm reading cases and I'm immersed in a culture that has been used to suppress, oppress, depress, repress people that have looked like me for six centuries. And so what does it mean to be proximal and intimate with something that does not see me as human? And I think there's also an opportunity, like Dr. Pinnell said, to ask more radical questions about what does it mean to have power in a place and space that intentionally removes power from you? And I think that's where my mentality is being. And so when you talk about to what extent has what's happened over the last year two years or six centuries impacted my call to action, it's reminded me of two things. First and foremost, the power in our stories, right? Black stories specifically are the assets that break generational curses and build generational wealth. And the extent to which we can walk into spaces that are intentionally anti-Black, racist or white supremacist, and unapologetically express the power in our stories, that's how we make it make sense. But then the second piece that I think is important, and it goes back to this idea of what does it mean to share power bi-directionally? It's understanding that even in an environment where people might tell you that you're not valuable, that does not revoke your value because our power does not come from that. It comes from something that the world did not, did not give us, thus it cannot take away. And so I believe in this moment when there's so many narratives that are intersecting about what needs to be done, I think we as a community have to ask ourselves, what is it that we need? And you know what we need right now? Us because we are who we need in times like these. So again, it's a pleasure to be on the panel. I look forward to a lot more commentary, but I really, really appreciated that comment about sharing and being proximal. And what does it mean to, to see power in a bi-directional way as well? Absolutely. The real question is in light of the many challenges, uh, economic, racial, social, uh, what have you been doing to ensure that your work um, is committed to those efforts? And then what ways have you maybe had to pivot or change your commitment uh, so that they enable those efforts? So, you know, I would say for us, it's interesting. Our plan has never changed uh, of what we've decided to do from the time that we were founded to where we are now, right? Our goal was always to ensure that more people of color, Black people especially, have access to opportunities and technology, whether that's career or whether that's um, entrepreneurship. And so I think the thing that's changed the most is there is a big light being shined on everything that has happened in our world. And everyone has been sat down to see it. And so what happens is that there's an opportunity to press a huge reset button 
which means that we now get to go forward in making decisions about how we as youth, millennials, Gen Zers, or even you know boomers or older generations start to solve problems, right? Um, for the first time ever, everything's been shaken up and thrown in a bucket and we're stuck trying to figure out how to make it work. And we've been able to make a lot of decisions really quickly um, that have shown some really great impact, which leads me to believe that um, a lot of the things that we've been fighting for for so long that people say we can't change, we actually can. Um, but it's about taking that energy, that time and using it to truly reset. I think, you know, from our position, we just need to continue to be uplifted. I think our groups need to continue to be uplifted and we need to be supported equitably. Right. Um, that means partnerships. That means um, corporations, private, public. Um, it means black voices need to be centered at every conversation we have about equality. It means that we should be the, be the ones making the decisions when it comes to who gets capital for their business, where we get to go to school, places of safety. Like we need to be able to be in charge of those things, because I think what we've now seen is that no one can be responsible for us but us. And so I think what's so powerful about the group here is that everyone has taken their bit of the journey and have been able to turn it into something that can be truly impactful. For me, it's capital access for Black people in, in technology, right? Like, I want to make sure that more Black people are getting access to venture capital, something we don't talk about enough. I want to make sure our businesses are much more sustainable by in including tech and tech enablement in order to make those things more positive. That's how I personally protest. And I think everyone is taking their personal um, gifts, the things that they're loving to do and turning them into the way that they're going to be able to change lives uh, longer term. And so I think as long as we all remain on that same path and as long as we know that we now have the ability to do whatever we want, um, I think we'll continue to see massive, massive change in our community. Absolutely. And last but not least, Commissioner Allen. Yes, uh, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Congressman Carson, for the opportunity to share. I always look forward to this panel. One of the things that I think is very important in this time for me, given this last year, is education um, and engagement. Uh, last year, I decided in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of racial injustice, not to just sit back and protest, but actually get involved in the process. And so I ran for political office. And what I found myself doing every day when I had an opportunity to talk to voters was education. So many times, the everyday citizens and voters simply don't understand the day-to-day -day politics. I tell people all the time that uh, you may not want to be an elected official, but you can't avoid politics. Uh, when you were in fact born in the state of Indiana, you are not officially born to the health commissioner signs off on your birth certificate. The health commissioner is usually an elected or appointed official. Uh, when you in fact die in the state of Indiana, are uh, you not in fact deceased officially into the county coroner? signs off on their death certificate and the county court is typically an elected official. So everything from birth to death has to deal with politics. I always encourage people to get engaged, to get educated, to understand how things affect them that matter to you. Because if you advocate for the things that matter to you, you can almost see instant change in your community. And always remember that politics is definitely local. A lot of times we focus on what's national, but it's the politics, it's the school board, it's the city county council, it's the mayor's office that affect our day-to-day -day lives that we have to be engaged and involved consistently. And what that means is that when you go vote, and I hope that you do vote, is that it doesn't stop there. That's when work begins. That means that after you elect people to office, you have to show up to community meetings. You have to show up uh, at committee meetings. You have to make sure that your voices continue to be heard and make sure that you're holding those that you voted for accountable to make sure they're ensuring that your values are passed through. Thank you so much. I want to remind you all, um, if you could please stick to the order that we've just followed as we go into this next question, which is um, that we know as a result of calls against systemic uh, calls for injustice, companies, schools, and many organizations are committing to donating to the fight against inequity. But I'm so curious to all of our panels, uh, if you think these efforts are, as Jay-Z says in Minority Port, just a band-aid or are they going to actually deliver justice to us um, as there's a fight against so many tools that deliver justice such as the Voting Rights Act and affordable health care and college access and gun control? 
I think that the most important thing for Black women in charge, and Kelly, I love what you said about explaining all of our passions essentially as niches within our communities. And for Black women in charge, it's very important that we don't stick to a very particular niche, but instead bring people that have the passions and are left out of the rooms into the rooms. And in that way, we stick to the liaison forefront, whereas a lot of people, for example, right now we're working on public health sectors. So for all of 2021, we're doing um, three different trimesters. The first one is the USDA corporation um, partnership, for lack of better way, words, we have a grocery prescription program, which means that we brought a lot of urban farmers to the forefront with the state health department, with the mayor's office, with a bunch of different organizations that have left them out, but we are not becoming urban farmers ourselves. Then we also have the infant and mother mortality crisis um, trimester, which was our second one, where we interviewed a bunch of different Black health professionals and explained to them that these are the people who have difficulty, especially for Black women, advocating for themselves in a healthcare setting, because sometimes understanding that though you do not identify as a marginalized group of a particular oppression or a particular struggle, for lack of better words, that does not mean that someone else does not. And that also does not mean that I'm in the position to speak for them. So instead of Black women in charge, we give them the opportunity to actually come to the table themselves, tell the elected officials themselves what the problem is. And using, I would say, our intersectional approach to social justice as a whole has definitely been very beneficial for us instead of identifying as a Black Lives Matter organization, for example, although that is what we did with the legislation with IMPDs very specifically and very, um, I would say that was the most Black Lives Matter directed thing that we've done as an organization. And from there, we've started to frame everything else as a human rights violation. Because in that way, we understand that corporations, the people once again in charge, really understand things in a lot more clear and concise way if they understand that not only are you violating the rights of a very particular race, first and foremost, you're also violating the rights of people directly in your family by not giving, once again, I'm sorry, I forgot who said, the specific information, I believe it was Kenneth, giving people the education and giving them the right to know what you know as an elected official is so much more important to us as an organization than picking one specific issue. There's so much I could add to that. Um, I think where I must start is by quoting Dr. Cameron Jones, who looms large in public health, looms large in racial justice and health justice. Um, and she describes racism as a system of structuring opportunity whereby one group is disadvantaged based on skin color or phenotype, and another group is advantaged based on skin color and phenotype, but the strength of the society as a whole is sapped. Um, so as a public health physician and understanding racism as a system, I see the collision of multiple systems that have prevented black lives, have prevented um, black futures from actualizing the fullness of our divinity, the fullness of our humanity. Um, and so whether or not we're truly at a watershed moment, I think is left up to us as well as left up to others who are partnering, collaborating with us and holding um, those in power accountable. Uh, so for instance, for me, you can imagine that this pandemic has fundamentally ripped open um, a wound, a gaping wound in this nation. Um, it did not um, define health disparities or even health care disparities or even health equity inequities for the first time, but it put it on blast. It crystallized it such that powers that be could no longer ignore it or the public could no longer just live with it. Um, and so because we've seen the collision of multiple pandemics, coronavirus, systemic racism, mental health, and a host of other issues all at once, and we've seen earthquakes of devastation, it's going to take sustained effort so that we're not stuck in a pendulum moment. And let me just briefly explain what a pendulum moment is. So often in the trajectory of this nation's history, we've made an advance, but then that pendulum has swung in the opposite direction with just as much ferocity as the change did. So in public health and in healthcare and well-being in, in American life um, more generally, we need to break out of that tradition of advance followed by regression and said, say we've suffered enough loss as a society as a whole that has been shouldered disproportionately on the backs of black and brown folks that we need to fix things fundamentally. And so we're gonna to have to continue to have 
passion attached to that purpose, which oftentimes is rooted in our pain, um, and keep that at the forefront of people's thoughts, keep that at the forefront of policy conversation, keep that at the forefront of budgets. And that's what I'm thinking about as a public health physician. How do I connect with people outside of the health sector to impress, to um, coalesce around the idea that all of the collective work that we do matters for the well-being of the whole? I would agree with that. It's a band-aid. It's not going to um, change things immediately. I mean, the system is so broken, you know, it really needs to be flipped on its head. But also, I don't think that gives us an excuse to not participate or not try to change things. So I think it's, you know, for me, what I do is like, I try to really pay attention to, you know, what is going on locally here in the city. So, you know, for example, if there's a proposal for the, um, the police department to get, you know, more money when, you know, uh, there are other, you know, social services that aren't as well funded. It's like looking at that, I mean, like, okay, um, why is this happening kind of thing? But it's also, you know, as um, Commissioner uh, Allen uh, alluded to, it's participating in those processes. And it's, I think it's a lot of, you know, pol political education too, and getting people to understand how a lot of these decisions are made and who are, who are the decision makers in a lot of these cases. So I try to help um, in that sense, but I think that's the way to you know, go about it now with the processes that we have in place. Yeah, that's such an incredible question. And I think it's packed. But the first thing I'll say is to go back to some of the specific language used in your original question, Jordan. You had mentioned whether or not the dollars that were donated, right, were seen as a band-aid or not. I wanna go back to that real quick. You know, lack of access to capital in a capitalistic society will leave you feeling it being treated like a lowercase letter. And Black folks in this country specifically have continued to be felt and feel like lowercase letters. So I won't say that capital is not part of the equation. And we got an incredible advocate for Black folks getting the capital immediately to the right of my camera screen and Kelly Jones. You know, I couldn't have been able to talk about capital without I do not seeing Black women like Kelly leading that work, not just in the city, not just in the state, not just in the Midwest, but across the country. So I wanna give kudos where kudos is due. What I also say is something I started the conversation with. If we wanna talk about capital, let's talk about assets. And the greatest asset we have as a community is our stories. So when you talk about the extent to which the dollars being donated are or not band-aids, which I understand to be temporary solutions to permanent problems, let's talk about the capital that we've had. And we've had a similar narrative for six centuries, talked about that before. So you talk about what a sustainable change look like, it sits aside of our stories. What narrative is our community believing in internalizing? Too many of us are forced to pour from empty cups. That doesn't make any sense, sense, or sensational impact across the census. So you talk about what a sustainable change look like moving forward, it sits inside of our stories. It sits inside of our stories. And again, Kelly mentioned something like this earlier. When I talk about the term black liberation, I describe it as centralizing black stories specifically. When we walk into rooms and are forced to conform, to fit, to assimilate, and assimilation the assassination of our character and integrity. When you're forced in every room to fit into a box that breaks down your black body, your black mind, and your black spirit, you have no opportunity to be able to sustain. You maintain systems that do justice for the criminals in gray suits and crispy white shirts. And again, that don't make sense, sense, or sense. So you talk about what does sustainable change look like? trying to have a solution-oriented conversation, it comes with Black folks choosing to centralize our own stories. Last thing I'll say, because I know I'm near my two minutes. Last thing I'll say. What's also extremely important is that we understand that you can't fix this problem. You got to heal from this problem. Dr. Purnell talked about this wound that was ripped open. This One of the reasons why the wound is so deep and it hurts so bad is because we've normalized the pain. And when that wound gets ripped open over and over and over again, you never heal from it. A scab can't even scab to become a scar if they never got time to heal. And there's so many companies and corporations thinking that your million dollars can fix a problem that's existed for six centuries. You can only heal from something like that. And that starts with centralizing the stories of the most marginalized. And that's the people on this call and the communities that we represent. You know, I I wake up every single morning fully understanding that I would not have a $20 million venture capital fund if not for systemic racism. 
Um, and it's really, it's a really hard thing to deal with every single day. The fact that I have been struggling to raise a fund since 2019, and it wasn't until a black man was killed that I am now able to get capital <laughs> for me to invest in my people, right? Um, and so there's some times where I'm feeling very disenchanted with it, right? Like, it's like, man, just like, here's these charity dollars like coming to us and we're, you know, we're being treated like, you know, like we just don't have any ownership or, or the opportunity to do anything really important in our community. When the interesting thing is, is we now get an opportunity to actually show and prove what we're doing, but we can't do things the way we've done them before. We cannot go into the next 100, 200, 300 years running on systems and processes the way that they've currently been, been done. And I still, it like very much believe, and I think Anthony alluded to this too, is that we cannot have change unless we are centered first. Like we have to be at the table. We need to be making the decisions. We need to be in the rooms with these white corporations when they're determining where they want to put this money. Because what's what's going to happen, and I can already see it, is a number of non-white organizations um, wanting to advocate for this work and people like us being left out. Because, you know, someone has said that they can solve a problem for us. Um, I think what we've seen is that no one can solve any problems for us because we wouldn't be in the situation that we were last summer during a pandemic and during Black Lives Matters. We wouldn't be losing our, our businesses. We wouldn't be out of work. We wouldn't be, you know, suffering way more than any other person um, of, of another race or, or anything like that. So until we're ready to not only take kind of what's coming out of corporations in the public profit sector, they go directly to black people or people of color that can make those systemic changes. And then we watch that multiply. Um, I, I just, I can't see it going any further than that. Like, and I think back to, to Murdoch's point is we have to be willing to own our narratives. It, we are no longer here to be tokens. We are no longer here to just represent a black face on a screen with other white people. Like we are here to build the things that did not exist 50 years ago. We are here to replace the organizations that have not done what they said they were gonna do hundreds of years ago. And I think we're the only ones to do it. And that's where I'm putting all my money. I'm putting all my money on you guys. Uh, Jordan, I, I don't even think it's a Band-Aid. It's a piece of tape and some tissue that they've uh, dispersed out uh, during these great times, considering the pain and the grief that our people have had to deal with for over 400 years. Uh, the first question I talk about education and engagement, I wanna give another E, I'm a Baptist preacher as the Congressman said, and that's empowerment. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the unity of the African-American people is more powerful than an atomic bomb. What does that mean? That means that when we come together, when you look at a state like Indiana, when it snows in the wintertime, a single snowflake is insignificant, it's meaningless, but when those snowflakes come together in a unified effort, they have the ability and the capacity to shut down streets, shut down cities and shut down states, but it's only when they come together. When you look at the buying power and the access of resources we have as a people, we are doing much better than our parents financially from a perspective, yet we still haven't learned to pull our resources together. What would it look like if all the African-American people in Indiana uh, were able to sow into a fund to make that 20 million that Kelly Jones has, 30, 40, 50 million, but it only happens when we come Come together and utilize our resources and help and support each other. We have the power. We just have to come together to do so. So powerful. Um, and I deeply regret that this is the last question I'll be asking in the discussion. Um, and so I ask that you all, if you'd like to also include closing remarks in this very last question, um, that you do that. But I want to face it, you know, many marginalized people feel distrustful of government. Uh, they believe that those elected don't always seek to serve us. And this is honestly supported by low minority voting turnout rates, uh, particularly Black voting rates and critical elections like congressional and statewide in local races. So what words of encouragement do you have to fellow Black folks about exercising our right to vote? Why is that so imperative? 
The number one, of course, we have a mission statement as an organization with Black Women in Charge, but internally, which a lot of people don't know, our personal or interpersonal mission statement to each other is just to save a million lives and to vote. And the reason why we say a million lives is because all of us are within STEM. We're all college age women. I'm sorry, I don't believe I said that, but we're all in college and we're all in our progressive field. As you could say, we're in STEM or in business. And one of the things that we realize coming into it is that, of course, there is power and diversity within the Black community, but there's also power in stretching your hands in many different directions. So although I will be a pre-health, well, I'm currently a pre-health student, and I will be a healthcare leader in our country, and we also need our CFO Langdon to be a business leader so that she can invest in my healthcare funds. And then we also need all of the creative people within my organization so that Black creatives feel like they're not being disenfranchised. And I think that one of the things that that rounds back out to your question is to vote is understanding that there have been so many different types of Black people that have been from beginning told that they don't matter in even picking who is in charge of nonprofits, for example, who is in charge or who's allowed to go to a very specific meeting with the mayor. So if you're not even allowed by your own community first to be yourself, to stretch your arms in whatever direction you choose, and to also understand that whoever you decide to be when you grow up, because we tell Black people, is okay and that it is validated within your own community first, I personally would never vote for any white person. I would never vote for any position if my own community does not vote for me. And so understanding that as a Black person, you do deeply need to understand that your identity is not more or less validated. You are not more or less Black first. That is so imperative to understanding that you do matter on a local, state, or federal level in a government circumstance, because the government is the last thing on the majority of Black people's minds. It is the very last thing that they think about when they wake up in the morning, when they have to go to school, for example, and hear that they are not fitting in, quote unquote, with the Black group, or that they are, once again, more or less Black than another person that disenfranchises them internally, and then they should never be allowed or expected to participate externally with anything. If you have that level of cognitive dissonance internally, how could you ever be expected to portray yourself in an external way in any way that you should accurately be represented? So in that way, as far as voting goes, I think that first we need to work within the Black community because I believe it was Anthony said that we need ourselves first. And of course, in Indiana, the majority of our elected officials, for better or for worse, will be white people that we will be asking Black people to endorse and to trust in and believe in when their own community is never set up for them on just the ground circumstances and making them feel like they have a place and that their thoughts, opinions, lives matter just within their own community. So my closing remarks would be for Black people, for everyone on this call speaking and for everyone listening is to make the Black people within your organization, your community, feel heard by you first because they will never be heard or never feel heard on a larger scale if that's not the case. Once again, there's so much to be said, right? So it's what do you say with the time that you have? Um, I think it's important that we all understand what power is. Um, Power can be defined in so many ways. Power is self-love. Power is community love. Um, Power is self-actualization. Power is community actualization. Power is access to capital. Um, Power is identifying and leveraging the assets within your sphere um, and demanding um, and even taking control of assets that may be outside of your sphere, but you need them to effectuate a positive outcome. Um, I've talked about racism as a system of structuring opportunity. So we know that uh, Blacks, uh, Black people, we die uh, quicker um, from illnesses that others live longer with um, because of how racism impacts care. So racism impacts access to care. Um, Racism impacts the quality of care that you receive. And racism impacts life opportunities. Um, Those life opportunities can also be described as a social determinant of health where you are born, where you live, where you age, where you play or recreate, where you pray, where 
where you go to school and where you work. So if we understand that all of that collectively helps to decide whether or not you have the opportunity to be healthy, then you want to know, well, what tools, what's in my hand? If we go back to Adam Clayton Powell, what's in your hand to be able to, to you know, destroy, disrupt, dismantle, tear down the system that's not achieve, achieving the outcome that you need and to design, cultivate, build the system that can. So I'm looking at systems at those three levels, access to care, the quality of care received, and access to the life opportunities that allow you to be well. Voting is central to all three of those things, whether that's voting at a ballot box or voting with your feet, showing up and demanding change and advocating and agitating for change and holding systems accountable. Um, and so I started my comments talking about the power of the vote, right? My parents grew up in the Jim Crow era. My grandparents did not have the right to vote always. Before my grandmother died at the age of 97, we had a conversation for how she voted for then President Barack Obama, but she was born into a country that did not recognize her humanity or her civil rights to be able to exercise that power, but yet she always knew she had power. So it's helping our people, helping our communities understand what power is, understand how to utilize power and the different levers in the system that power can be used to construct a whole happy and healthy society. And so I want everyone to know that public health is everything. Public health is not just medical care. Public health is the opportunity to be whole, to be healthy, and to be well. And all of the work that you do aligns with and is so very necessary for this society to function and for this society to be healthy. Thank you so much, Dr. Purnell. Anthony, we're going to go ahead um, as we'll circle back with Samantha. So we'll ask for you to go. No, absolutely. Uh, and it's so amazing. Uh, when someone wants to speak, how the system going to shut them down because they know they're going to say something that's powerful. So I can't wait to hear the commentary from Professor. But Dr. Purnell, goodness gracious, I can't wait to connect with you offline because the way in which you put these words together, the messages that move the people, my God, um, my goodness. But let me not forget what I was going to say. The piece that about the question you would ask was about the vote, right? Was about the vote. I think what's important, and if I can speak to my peers specifically, to anybody that's going to watch this, I think what's important is that we live in a society of symbols. We live in a society of symbols. So many different things are symbols, right? This black on hat has a brand on it. That's a symbol. Shout out to We Don't Run From Adversity. This polo I'm rocking has a symbol for a brand. Won't shout out the name because they don't need my shout out. This watch has a symbol, a brand a black on watch, shout out to Spring Break watches. Now these symbols only have the power that we give them, right? Now we understand that in a society of symbols though, brands have a lot of power. They promote emotions, they cause people to spend dollars, they can invoke actions and attitudes. Symbols might not be real, but they have real consequences. That goes the same thing for your vote. I'm not gonna sit here and say because you vote for one person or for another person, that our predicament as a people will change because no one person created the environment that we're in right now. So no one, no one person can save us from that. However, your vote is a symbol. Your vote is a symbol. In the same way in which you put certain symbols on when you get dressed in the morning because you understand the implications of those symbols, I want you to critically ask yourself when you do or don't exercise the ability for you to put on the symbol of your vote, what message are you sending? I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that to vote for one or vote for another is gonna change and fix everything. That's not how systems work, right? Systems are influenced by cultures, which first start with mindsets. And, but what I will say, what I will say, if you wanna to get to a place in space where we can create systems that dismantle system like Dr. Pinnell talked about, it starts with a decision that you make. And I think that a lot of us don't make decisions to engage in particular symbols because we have a misunderstanding of our own power. And so what I challenge you to do is not to question the power and potential in the symbols that you do and don't endorse. When it comes to a closing remark, goodness gracious, I say one thing, right? Loving yourself is a revolutionary action and you are worth the revolution, right? 50, 60 some odd years ago, it was said that black women are the least protected, the most disrespected, and the most neglected. That mean, and that's still true today. 
and I can cue so many more names because that's we have to say her name. But if all those things is true, that means a black man is the most dangerous. But then what about black folks who are trans or non-binary? They're not even seen as human. So to fall in love with something that is not worth protecting, not worth respecting, is consistently neglected, is seen as dangerous or not even human, that's revolutionary. And I think Kelly mentioned this earlier, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insane, right? James Baldwin talked about to be black and to be conscious in this country is to almost always be in a constant state of rage. So it would be insanely outrageous to continue doing the same thing over and over again. We, have, we are in a state of pandemonium, not one, not two, not three, but four pandemics. Don't do the same thing, do something different. And doing different is daring to think for yourself. I think for the people who are supposed to be right, have the platform to say that they're right, but think for yourself that's rooted in your own story. And I think that comes with you understanding the power and the symbols that you do and don't endorse. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak. Murdoch, as usual, you teed me up from a next thought. So the interesting thing about this question is like the, the two parts, right? One is marginalized communities being distrustful of government. And then also how do we get people that look like us to exercise our right to vote? And in the essence of believing that everything can be turned on our head, is can we start having a conversation around how politicians come into our community and work with and thrive and talk to and liaise with our community so that we can build that trust? Um, because trust is the number one thing that is preventing us from believing in government, from taking advantage of opportunities. Um, we just don't trust it because it's nothing's ever been handed to us. Nothing's ever been handed out to us. We are constantly in a, in a state of trauma. Um, we enter this world in trauma, right? We wake up every day. We go to bed every day, you know, thinking about something that's happened to us. It's affecting our health in ways that, you know, are unheard of. And so I wonder when we can start having a conversation around understanding our power fully, right? We were able to sh close down an entire, like basically Georgia, you know, came down to a bunch of black people getting out there and deciding to vote in order to swing an election, right? We never thought Georgia would be able to swing an election. Black people swung an election, right? So I think what has to happen is that anyone that wants the support of our community has to come to our community and they have to come and talk to us. And not just the people that are, are propped up or seen as the important people, but the people that are got their feet on the ground doing the work, right? Like these are the people that we need to make sure are engaged in this process, especially if we're looking to build trust. I think Jasmine, or Yasmin, I'm sorry, brought up a really great point around, um, you know, how do you tap into all these different, you know, groups of people that are doing different things that, that all have different needs. And I can't say that I see a ton of elected officials coming in and speaking to, to us as regularly as they probably should. I can't even say I see a lot of leaders of very large organizations or corporations come in to speak to our community the way they should, but they want our power. They want our, their, our dollars, they want our votes. And so I think the question should be, how do we get more elected officials to come into our community and build trust with us so that we can figure out how to, to turn out and uh, vote the way that we need to effectively. And that's ending a question with a question, but that's that's sort of my my thoughts. Cause again, it's all about flipping everything over and, and systems just totally changing. I think from a closing remark state of view, I, you know, I think all of this is so very important to our system, but again, I do not want us to forget what our real power is. Um, we know that we have the opportunity to have trillions of dollars in buying power. We know that we influence culture. Um, we know that anything that's seen as cool, we probably did it first. When we choose to take ownership of that and then turn that into something that can be revenue generating and can change our economic standpoint, all of a sudden our entire country looks different. Right. All of a sudden, we are the ones that are in charge or in power. And so I hope that this talk and that everyone on, on the call um, will be willing to take a step to just do something they've never done before. Um, I always say do it scared. And sometimes doing it scared is all it takes. So thank you for having me as well. Well, I want to add on to that, you know, and just say that there are elected officials who are engage, not all, but many. Um, I think that engagement, I think this this panel is a witness of that engagement. Uh, and the fact that uh, you have so many stakeholders from across the country in Indiana here who otherwise would not have mixed with a Kelly Jones who's doing venture capital work 
as well as a Dr. Purnell and, 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 and bringing so many people together. And so uh, that has been a part of our project. Uh, I know Kenneth Allen's doing a lot of work, but the folks are out there. I think it's just a matter of, you know, 50, 60 years ago, because we were so limited in terms of where we could move, uh, we were limited to houses of worship. And I think in terms as, as, as that model has evolved, we still need our leader. That's why we have folks like Bishop Purnell, who's Dr. Purnell's brother and so many other great faith leaders. But I think as things have evolved, we have to get away from this idea that a one person or one entity is responsible for our liberation. Uh, there's no one imam, pastor, uh, entertainer who will be the Messiah or savior for all black people. I think that is a collective responsibility. There's no one politician that will take us out of our condition. So I think when we realize to your point, Kelly, that the power rests with us, we also have to make sure that we're leveraging that power and putting people on our school boards, in our Congresses, in our mayor's office, on our city councils to represent your and my interests in taxpayer dollars. But if we're expecting our elected officials and representatives to be our parents, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment and disillusionment. If we're expecting our elected officials to be these messianic figures who are gonna bring us to the seat of liberation, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment and disillusionment. When we truly understand the purpose and roles of these elected officials and what their responsibilities are, that gives us a different kind of leveraging point to make monumental change. I'll yield back to Jordan. Oh man, I'll, I'll yield that uh, last question to Commissioner Allen so that he can add something. And Samantha, it looks like you're back. Um, and so if the two of you would like to touch on that, I'll turn it right back around for a couple of seconds uh, to the representative so that um, we can close everything out. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, I mean, to your original question, voting, I think voting is extremely, you know, it's important. Um, I mean, I have, you know, friends who have been disillusioned by the whole process. They don't want to vote. You know, I, I, I try to do what I can. I, most recently, you know, the conversation went to like, I, you know, think about all the people who cannot vote, like, you know, in, in Indiana at, at any given time. I think most recently I, I checked because of a piece I'm working on. There are like 30,000 people that are under, you know, the Department of Corrections, the state's prison system. They cannot vote. Most of them won't be able to vote once they leave you know, um, the, our racist policies with felony disenfranchisement, you know, a majority of them won't ever be able to vote. So if you think about it like that, it, it is a privilege to vote. So, you know, doing what you can to make change, you know, you have a responsibility to vote in that sense. Um, as far as closing remarks, I'd say, you know, vote, <laughs> get involved as you can, um, you know, whether that's, you know, working on a political campaign, or if there's an issue you care about, you know, there are groups that aren't affiliated with any um, people who are wanting to run for elected office, you can, you know, get involved that way. Um, but yeah, I just say, get involved, figure out what you care about, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, use your voice. Um, don't be afraid to be the only one saying what you're saying, if you believe it's right. Last but not least, please, Commissioner. Yes, I would just add to the sentiments that's always been shared that yes, voting is absolutely important. Uh, just this past month, I read an article about 17 states that have made voting harder uh, and more restrictive. Uh, most of these states are Republican led. Uh, so it's definitely important. Uh, I was very fortunate um, by way of the congressman to attend the Congressional Black Caucus Leadership Boot Institute uh, several years ago. And Willie really talked about not only the importance of voting, we had an opportunity to have a conversation with the late great congressman John Lewis, who was beaten severely many times just for uh, African-American people in general, just to have the ability to vote. So voting is absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, it is not a panacea, it is not a cure-all, but it is an important tool in the tool belt to get things accomplished and to change some of the systems that we know need to be uh, turned around. I would say in my closing comments that um, uh, I hope that we don't just simply call this coming together something and leave this call and do nothing. I hope that we are encouraged and inspired to get engaged. Hope those that will view this will also get engaged. 
uh, understanding that vote, while voting is important, the other piece of it is that, you know, I'm a firm believer as a man of faith that prayers move heaven, uh, but money moves earth. So not only do we uh, have to do the work, we have to make sure that we're supporting candidates who make the sacrifice uh, to actually run for political office, because oftentimes we don't get the chance we want because we don't support candidates with our dollars and our resources. And we have to make sure that we're doing that to get good people in office and in position to make policy changes. So again, thank you for the opportunity to share. I couldn't have imagined a more incredible group um, who could come together and really speak to the issues that we're facing um, with words of hope, inspiration, but to quite, be quite honest with you, Truth, I wanna thank you all for your time today. And I would love to turn this back over to Congressman Carson. And I wanna thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, this has been an incredible, incredible discussion. Alhamdulillah, God is good. Thank you so much, Jordan, you did a fantastic job. Uh, thank you, Dr. Purnell. Thank you, Kelly Jones. Thank you, Anthony Murdoch. Thank you, Yasmeen Anderson. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. Thank you, Pref Professor Baran. Thank you to each and every one of you for participating. Thank you, Jessica Copeland and Felicity and the production team. I think uh, I hope to see some of you next year at our CBC ALC conference, but I also want to thank you for being leaders, for being for being thought leaders, for being entrepreneurial leaders, for being leaders in public health, and for taking the time out to participate in this panel. Hopefully someone will be blessed because of the words that you spoke today. I wish you all the best. Godspeed, salam alaikum, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition. Thank you. Thank you.